This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Edward Lutwak. Uh, in the fields of intelligence, military affairs, and foreign affairs, Edward Lutwak is a consultant, an operative, a military strategist, a public intellectual, and an author of 16 books. His newest book, is the grand strategy of the Byzantine Empire. Edward, welcome back to our program. What, tell us a little about the origins of this book. When did you decide to write it? The origins are in a misunderstanding. Uh, I wrote my dissertation at Johns Hopkins University on the Roman Empire, and it was called the grand strategy of the Roman Empire. This would have been what year? Uh, well, I, I blush to say back in 1975, a long time ago. And um, I conceived the, 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 the notion, born out of crass ignorance, that I could now sit down and do a matching pair, you know. I did the Grand Strategy of the Roman Empire, my doctorate, rather quickly, in a few months. So I, I figured I would spend a few months and do Byzantine Empire. That started a process that led to something like 25 years of research. You said at the beginning that I published 16 books. I, uh, 16 would include things like having written prefaces to collections of essays and so on. This book d certainly dwarfs 16 or the other 15 uh, because it took such a long time to research it. And all along there was so much interesting stuff that kept you going for all these years. I wasn't pushing up the hill. I was being drawn by the interest of it. But it's very difficult to work with these materials because I didn't, I couldn't go into a library and take out m documents and work on them. I had to translate from the original language um, things like uh, photocopied manuscripts and so on. And, and were, were more uh, materials being made available in the course of the period that, that you did this research? Yes. Byzantine studies had exploded in Europe back in the 17th century, it had then been crushed and destroyed by the Enlightenment. People like Gibbon and Voltaire hated the Byzantines, really killed off the Byzantine study. And then the revival is very late, it's only recently. Indeed, in the last 30 years, there's been a great efflorescence of Byzantine studies. Part of it, making available for the likes of me, texts that before were completely inaccessible, you know. Not only in the sense you had to find the manuscript in the library, but these were unedited manuscripts written in a very recondite complex language so that it would have been impossible to, to work in those conditions. During the course of the years, there's been a great, wonderful flowering uh, uh, from diverse characters. The father, George Dennis, who is actually now in Los Gatos, a Jesuit, published first uh, the great classic, uh, the Strategico Mauricius, perhaps the best known Byzantine book, and then uh, labored and produced successive treatises. One is about, and um, there was, in England, uh, Professor Holden at Birmingham started a whole school of Byzantine studies, and of course, uh, all sorts of people, Eric McGear, the Canadian fellow, and uh, a Chicago, and so a huge efflorescence of which I was the great beneficiary. Now, uh, uh, generally, academic studies or are not uh, uh, inviting to outsiders like yourself, in the sense that you are primarily a strategist, a yes. person who works on military affairs. What was the, compare the experience with how you were received by the scholars of Rome versus uh, the scholars of Byzantium. Right. Now, in both cases, 
I, my focus is strategy, my subject is strategy. But when I write about the Romans, I am a fellow, of course, who has to use the Latin sources and so on and so forth. I wasn't going to use secondary literature. So I did do a doctorate at Johns Hopkins, which is a respectable university, which is an, essentially a doctorate in the classics. Now, some of the, uh, the book aroused uh, uh, this called Grand Strategy of the Roman Empire. It, it aroused a lot of interest, uh, far more than a doctorate, uh, you know, a mere PhD should have done generating uh, entire dissertations to attack it, defend it, and if you go on Google, you'll see, I mean, hundreds of people, so for some reason, it excited support. But at no point was I embraced by the Roman historians, uh, although some were wrote very flatteringly about the book, and, you know, did get some very good reviews and so on. With the Byzantine studies, I, as a mere student of the field, started emailing these people, and they were extraordinarily generous in their response. The reason is that the studies have been flourishing studies. Mm -hmm. It is a very good field. It's a successful field. Instead of cuts and reductions, people, this expansion and so on, people are enormously interested in Byzantium artistically and culturally. And this high morale translated in a great willingness to help. And I got enormous help from people. I mean, I, I would send my, my, you know, email my rough manuscript, and people would print it out and go through and mm. correct it. And so, and enormously. This generosity reflects the great success of the field. Mm -hmm. uh, critical to talking about your book, it seems to me, is to talk briefly about strategy and your understanding of what strategy is. So let me ask you that question. What is strategy? Because we are in the realm of the strategy of the Byzantium Empire. Yes. Well, uh, strategy has two different faces. One is the bureaucratic face, which is here is an office called the Office of Strategic Planning, and they all sit down and they have their maps and their data and so on. And, and what they present as strategy is, I suppose, a more systematic way of doing what people always do, which is to lay down their aims and resources and so on. That is a quite different meaning to strategy, and that is the logic of strategy. And that is the very, uh, the contradictory logical strategy, the paradoxical logical strategy. We go through life using common sense, not paradox, not contradiction. If we want to go from, uh, from uh, here, Berkeley, to New York, we would try and look for the straightest interstate and go down it. Only in strategy, w which is defined by the presence of an enemy, somebody who's trying to stop you, if you want to go from A to B, you look for the most circuitous road. You want to see whether you can go, beat your way through a swamp or go over a mountain and so on, because then the enemy will not expect you. So it, strategy is the realm of contradiction, of paradox. Because you have an adversary waiting for you, if you do the straightforward thing, you have to do the after of maneuver, you have to do it. Now, things get more complicated because in strategy, things turn into their opposite. I mean, here you are, you're Napoleon, you're advancing, you're winning battles, you're advancing, you're winning more battles, and as you eventually advance far enough, so you outrun all your supplies, you exhaust your men, and suddenly you find yourself in Moscow in 1812, utterly defeated by your own victories. Because if Napoleon had been stopped right at the Russian border, he could never have destroyed his army and his empire by going too far. So war, and victory becomes defeat, war becomes peace. War, people fight, they kill each other, they burn things, they run out of energy, exhaust, and give up their ambitions. They scale down their ambitions they went to war for. So war brings peace. Likewise, the carelessness of peace, the failure to see the enemy pre preparing, or the failure to see that you yourself are being very provocative, brings war. So strategy is the realm where everything is upside down, everything is paradoxical and contradictory. I mean, phrases like, if you want peace, prepare for war. They capture this sense. So what happens is that in the realm of conflict, those who understand this logic do well. 
Those who don't, fail. If they're very rich and very have enormous resources, lots of gold, lots of men, lots of ammunition, then they can win anyway by brute force. But certainly they cannot win if they lack that, or if it's a kind of war, like a guerrilla war, where you cannot, the enemy doesn't assemble and, and disperse it. So not even with huge means can you win. So strategy divides the the uh, really the, the successful and the unsuccessful according to a rule entirely different from everyday life. And, and when we try to get a handle on strategy and uh, it's really uh, the way diplomacy, intelligence, and military force uh, are deployed together. Right, now this is, the logical strategy is all the, let's say the theoretical skeleton of all this. Then to make it happen in the overall statecraft, you first of all have diplomacy, which is that the best way to use your force is not to use it, is to have this ability for force, so people viewing it refrain from provoking you or others who are not your enemies and not afraid of you, viewing it say, oh, you're a good fellow to be allied with. So diplomacy is about not using force, but very often can only succeed if you have force. Indeed, it's very rare for diplomacy. So on the one hand, you have to build up maximum strength and readiness to fight, and B, not to use it, and not to be tempted into using it, and rather to hold it, let others view it, and then variously go to them to have them join you, or simply refrain from attacking you or whatever. But the non-use of force is the core of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Um, and intelligence is, of course, something that comes before all this and has to do with understanding the world. Extremely difficult thing to do, especially if you're in battle. If you're in battle and you're fighting and the enemy's in front of you, then you hate him, you fear him. All of this obscures your vision, makes it much harder. Uh, again, another paradox. To understand the enemy, to be able to defeat him well, you have to be sympathetic. You have mm. to understand them, and you can't do that if your mind is closed. You have to see it from his point of view, and then you'll be able to understand him, and then you'll be able to defeat him. Uh, and so this is, again, intelligence and diplomacy and war and the preparations for war, all of this live in this other world, the world of paradox. Uh, at, at one point, uh, you say, Strategy is an expression of an entire culture. And before you comment on that, uh, let's go back and see how you came to this problem. Here you are, a strategist. You're going to do a book on Byzantium. You're going to knock it off in a year. Uh, and then you wind up uh, taking much longer to do it. 20, so, 25 years. So, so uh, this is intriguing. So, so it's really the... I have a vision of you understanding strategy, going into the archives, and then suddenly realizing all that's there. Talk a little about that and explain this notion that strategy is an expression of an entire culture. Well, um, as I said, the Enlightenment had squashed Byzantine studies and persuaded people that Byzantium was a waste of time. It was the decadence. There was glorious Greece, magnificent realm, and then there was this decline and so on. Actually, the Enlightenment hated the religiosity of the Byzantines and so on. So I suppose I was a victim of, of the same pre narrow prejudice. I figured that the Romans had done wonderful things, the Byzantines had then lingered for centuries. When I went into it, I discovered, of course, that things were quite different. Uh, the first, I, a very simple fact, the Byzantine Empire, lasted by the shortest reckoning from, let's say, the time of Attila, let's say 400, to the Fourth Crusade, 1204, when Constantinople was conquered by the resurgent Westerners, the Latins, the Catholics, the Venetians, the French, the Normans, and so on. Um, so that would give us 800 years. 
If you wanted to, you could then take the revived uh, Byzantine Empire, this the later Byzantine Empire, that lasted for till 1453, but I don't do that because I believe that the empire really, uh, what the Turks defeated in 1453 was not the Byzantine Empire, it was just a city-state and so on. So, they lasted longer than any other empire in history. No Chinese dynasty pulled more than 300 years or so. No state that we know of lasted 800 years, none. And then I started discovering why they lasted. And I discovered that it was because they possessed a strategic culture that was very firmly rooted and was giving them a whole uh, inventory of right things to do when faced with the unending succession of enemies that rolled up to the borders of Byzantium from the great Eurasian steppe and across Asia and Iran and so on. And, and the empire, uh, so, so we have this combination of an empire that lasted a long time that was quite extensive. I, you, you say Byzantium reached a thousand miles east from Constantinople to the Caspian shore, more than a thousand miles west across Europe, more than 500 miles north to Kivi and Rus, and then as far south as Egypt. So it was quite an expanse, and then enemies on all sides. Yes, yes. The, the western, when the Roman the Roman Empire as a whole was divided in two. Upon the death of Theodosius the Great in 395, the western part was the good part because the western part was Spain and France. They were facing the Atlantic Ocean. And then, yes, they had a, a dangerous border with the Germanic peoples on the Rhine, but there was a lot of depth. In the case of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire that called itself Rome until the last day, but which we call Byzantine by modern habit, you know, 17th century habit, this eastern half was much less fortunate. It didn't have strategic depth. And instead of having Germanic tribes and on the Rhine, it had the Danube border which was directly facing the great Eurasian steppe, where the enemies were much more dangerous. There was the great Huns, Attila's Huns, and then the Avars that were like product-improved Huns, even more advanced. And after that came other Turkic riders, the Bulgars and so on, and then the Magyars, and then eventually the Pechenei Skumans, and finally the Mongols, all slamming against this border. On the other side, they had the open border on the east with the Iranian plateau, the land of the Iranian empires. And the Sassanid Persian Empire was the only other superpower. So when they divided the empire in two, it was only administrative. Both sides were supposed to fight for both sides. There wasn't two different, no, no rivals, not even separated. It was simply administrative. But when the Western side collapsed in the fifth century and gave up, the Eastern side found itself with the strongest enemies, the most dangerous borders, without being able to call on the other half, which had disappeared. It's the Western side that should have lasted mm. for, for centuries. Much better secured, indeed, and yet it was the Eastern side centered on Constantinople that lasted down the centuries, and that was because they were able to react to all this by inventing a strategy, inventing a grand strategy, which they then followed and developed. And, and th this becomes very important because uh, what your book reveals that you are discovering is an innovative quality, an ability to adapt, to be flexible, and to play off these three variables, military power, diplomacy and persuasion, and intelligence. So, so that, that's what you were finding as a strategist. Yes, well, what I was finding was that they survived longer than any other empire because they had a much better strategic culture than any other empire, far superior to anything we know from any other part of the world. And it was indeed composed from their clear sense of the harmonious 
the, how to build harmonious interactions between intelligence, diplomacy, and force. Now, the Roman tradition had been that when you see an enemy, you mobilize your troops, you gather up your army, and now you will crush them, destroy them, make peace, you make a solitude and call it peace. You destroy the enemy, mm. you proclaim it with great sun. The Byzantines totally could not do that. They didn't have the strength. And if they had reacted to the arrival of each new enemy by mobilizing all the strength, assembling the biggest possible army, fighting the whole war, exhausting themselves, losing casualties to destroy utterly the enemy, they would then have lost twice. First, because the, as soon as the next enemy arrives, they would have been exhausted and easily defeated. The other is that by destroying the first enemy, their diplomacy would have nothing to work with. Instead, they learned to contain the enemy that couldn't be persuaded and talked out of attacking, even if you tried very hard to bribe him, divert him, make him an ally, befriend him. You fail. Okay, but then you don't destroy him. You don't encircle him and wipe him out. You contain him. Hence, infantry is less useful than cavalry because cavalry can skirmish and so on. And you contain him, and you don't want to destroy him not only because you don't want to expend your own strength in destroying him, but also because you know that there's somebody else sh coming down the, the pike towards you, and you want to contain him and then befriend him and make him your ally to guard your own borders. Now, if this enemy cannot be reconciled, if he's too ferocious, if he doesn't understand the scheme, doesn't understand the benefit of it, then to the country, you go to the approaching enemy who is further away, and you say to him, come forward, there's wonderful pasture for your horses, and we will provide grain along the way for you, and we'll give you some gold, and then persuade them to accelerate their coming. So they'll slam into the back of this unreconcilable enemy. So they started, instead of diplomacy as an adjunct of force, hmm it is forced that becomes an adjunct of diplomacy. You solve your problems diplomatically. And only then, as a last resort, do you use force, and when you do, as little as possible. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're saying uh, in, in writing in the book that uh, for a number of reasons, they had a, the Byzantines had a global vision that allowed them to see the whole board on the one hand. But on the other hand, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, they had institutions that allowed them to do that. Right. Now, we have hard evidence for this. Uh, there is a book called De Administrando Imperium, that's being the Latin title of a nameless text, which was written by the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus, or at least his signature is on it, which is full of advice for his son on how to run the empire. It's actually about foreign policy. And it is a catalog mm -hmm. of all the different peoples who inhabit the areas around the mm -hmm. empire. And explaining not only, it wasn't just an inventory, saying here are the Magyars, the Hungarian, the future Hungarians that he calls uh, Turco, actually. Here are the Pechenegs, who are the, one of these nomadic mounted archer people. He doesn't just list them and say, here they live and so on, but explains how the politics works and then says how you can use one against the others. He says, befriend the Pechenegs who are behind the Magyars, the, the Turkoi. If you're friends with the Pechenegs, the Hungarians will never dare to attack you mm -hmm. because you'll be able to go to the Pechenegs and they'll take them back. Here is Kiev on Rus, which is the Viking, the Viking Slavic whatever uh, kingdom, first Russian state, Kiev on Rus, in what is now Ukraine, and how you deal with them. And here are the Arabs, and how you deal with them. So this, the Administrando Imperi, is a book that tells us right away that they had this view, hmm. a huge expanded view. They looked as far far away as into Central Asia, right through the Middle East, and of course, they writes a lot about the West as well. So yes, 
we, the, we, we can say they have a global vision and we can document it. And indeed, we can also document something else, the quality of Byzantine intelligence, because this was a secret book based on intelligence reports, and we know the value of them, because to this day, if you are a Hungarian or a Serb or a Croat, and you want to write down your own history, you have to use those reports. The early history of the peoples of the Balkans, but also Persian history, uh, they rely on Byzantine intelligence documents. Mm -hmm. They were, they are, without them, the Hungarians would be unable to say anything about their history until their very late arrival in what is today Hungary. And same is true of the Serbs, the Croats, it's true of the Bulgarians, of course, and it's true across, on the other side of the, the Persians, and, uh, and indeed even the Arabs. Arab historical record will be totally incomplete without the actual datings and placings of the Byzantine intelligence reports. So, and, and uh, what, what becomes clear throughout your book when you go to a number of these documents is the extent to which we're not just talking about uh, information about the militaries of these other people. We're, we're talking about the culture, the mores, uh, their way of life, uh, uh, really anthropological studies. Right. Right. This was a, a very well-established tradition. In fact, everything we know about Attila comes from the account by Prisco Supanium, who was a young literate intellectual gentleman, young man, who was sent along on a diplomatic mission to Attila. Indeed, that mission contains all the legs of the Byzantine system. There is the patrician diplomat, the, the ambassador. So not a regular professional foreign service, but well, somebody who's been designated. Designated, yeah. definitely designated. Yeah. We have the patrician negotiator, you know, the, uh, the elegant fellow. Then we have the secret agent. His name is Vigilas, and his job is not to negotiate with Attila or understand Attila, mm -hmm. but to recruit somebody who will assassinate Attila, because somebody back in Constantinople the, uh, the statesman running the show is certain Chrysaphios, who is much uh, attacked, a eunuch and some, uh, but who was, I think, the real inventor of this. Chrysaphios correctly reasoned that the Huns were not anything important until Attila, and that if Attila was removed, the Huns would become mm -hmm. a bunch of, of uh, loose nomads correctly analyzed that this is a case we want to knock off the enemy, assassinate Attila, hires Vigilus to do it. And the third component is this Priscus Opanium, who is detailed description of how Attila ruled. Why was Attila in explaining, showing all his tricks, how at the big banquet everybody ate of plates of gold and Attila of wood? and how everybody was wearing magnificent robes and he had a simple thing. And that they ate all kinds of complicated, you know, cuisine stuff and he ate just a slab of meat. This is the charismatic leader who, who, who show off uniform is the uniform that has no medals. This is irresistibly reminds one of Hitler wearing his plain brown, surrounded by glittering generals who were at his back and call. Uh, so, Priscus tells us how the Huns lived, how they died, how they ruled, and provided a broad understanding that enabled Chrysaphius back in Constantinople to figure out a strategy to deal with Attila and survive Attila, which he did. Uh, I, I want to help have you help us understand what positioned uh, the Byzantines to be so flexible. You, you, you talk about the importance of their core identity, made up of the Christian faith, the culture of ancient Greece and Roman pride, uh, combined to reject surrender and inspire tenacity. So, so there was a, a cultural coherence here uh, that flowed from their past that that positioned them to do the kinds of things we're talking about? Well, in their military manuals, one comes across all kinds of clever tricks. In their diplomacy, they had all kinds of clever tricks. And intelligence is all about clever tricks. But the Byzantines did not last for 800 years or more 
by, with a bag of tricks. They lasted, first of all, because they were rooted in a very strong identity, as you mentioned, which gave them not only a great moral strength, when they were beleaguered and surrendered and times you know happened that they lost the whole empire was overrun by invaders they only had constantinople and yet they resisted and they reconquered and they expanded again this moral strength did come from first a christian faith that was more intense and more unquestioning than a, a modern people can perhaps imagine secondly not only did the, like modern Greeks uh, be proud that there was ancient Greece, they knew it. They had great delight, sensual pleasure from reading their Homer. They had deep instruction and philosophical satisfaction from reading their Thucydides. They read their Plato and Aristotle, and they gave them great comfort intellectually to have this, and also historic perspective, because they didn't have the calendar in front of them, but they knew that Thucydides was 500 BC, roughly. They knew it was a long time before. And so when they faced the enemy of this morning, they did so in the knowledge that there have been so many enemies now long forgotten. So many seemingly formidable people have disappeared. And there we are, we're still here. And the Roman, of course, gave them very good institutions. The Roman army with its unique skill, which is training people, mm -hmm. training really training in a way that armies didn't do again until modern times. And we're talking about a year's training. Of, oh, of yes. 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 Yeah. And yes. this training yeah. adapted to the weaponry of the adversary. Absolutely. That was it. It is not shaken, even today, even today, if you go to Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on, you meet soldiers who have only joined the army maybe a year ago, six months ago, nine months ago, uh, but certainly a year ago. In the Byzantine case, you wouldn't be brought near the enemy until you have been trained for two years and longer. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very thorough. This is the Roman tradition, very thorough training. We have in Josephus a description, all, you know, how you have extra heavy weapons. You don't train with the normal sword. You train with the heavier sword, so in battle, it, you know, and very detailed skills accumulation so that the individual soldier was a fully trained craftsmen of war. So the unit as a whole could maneuver and do its own unit training of learning to maneuver. They wouldn't have to go back all the time to do remedial and so on. So they, did, they had all that and adapted. When they went to the battlefield and they came across a certain enemy, they could assemble because they knew how to use the sword, the spear, the lance, the javelin and so on, but also the very demanding weapon, the one more demanding than any of them, which is the powerful composite bow copied from the Huns. That was the great secret weapon of the Huns, the most powerful weapon in antiquity. Mm -hmm. Now to learn to use that, first of all, some people can never learn. So they had slingers for that. They gave them slings, you know. And the people who could learn would go through a very detailed program of instruction. We have detailed we have a guidebook that survives exactly on how to do it. And it, to teach a normal human being who is not a native-born mounted archer from the Mongolian steppe who started at age two, but somebody who comes in at 18 or 19, how to train him to learn to use this powerful but very difficult weapon, and then train him how to ride a horse, and then to train him to use the mount to be a mounted archer, which is the most difficult thing you could imagine. There are people who practice it today in Japan, and it is fantastic what they do, but it's also fantastic how many years it takes for them to learn the skill. The Byzantine army did it routinely. They manufactured units of mounted archers, which meant taking people in at 18, 19, and going, training them for three or four years before they could use them. Now, the other institution that you emphasize in the book, besides the training, is tax collection. Yes. So, so they had inherited or adapted a system to essentially garner the resources to, to pay for these conflicts. Right. I mean, all the, all the historic governments we know of, Henry VIII um, in the Renaissance, the medieval governments, 
indeed, even governments much later than that. How did they raise funds? They raised funds by very crude methods, such as um, having um, tolls on roads, you know, like Paris used to have uh, customs barriers around it. You brought your wheat to sell in the market, you had to pay a tax. Crude physical methods like that, that were very distortive and didn't capture the wealth of the country. The Byzantines had a system inherited from Rome. It's one of the great institutional gifts that they got from Rome, the continuity, um, which was, had the bureaucracy that went around val judging the productivity of single fields, in terms of how much wheat they could produce, how many animals they could sustain. They would then write it in a register. Then they would on the basis of a central budget, they would make a central budget. How much money do we need for, our, our, for the court, for the diplomacy, for the army, and so on? And say, well, we need so many gold coins. Then they would allocate this tax to the different provinces and districts and sub-districts and sub-districts. And on the basis of their productive capacity, the money, the gold would be brought to Constantinople, then the gold would be spent from Constantinople to pay for soldiers, officials, the maintenance of this and that, factories where they produce weapons, and then the gold this way came back because people ultimately got the, had the gold and they went back to buy food and to buy wheat and meat and fish and so on, so the gold would then come back to the primary producers who would have the gold in hand to pay the taxes. This system not only provided the emperor with ready access to, to gold and gave him the ability to maneuver in a way that medieval sovereigns could not maneuver, uh, but also generated a circulation of money, uh, which uh, enabled the Byzantine economy to develop. In the, every town you had a market. The market was where the farmer brought his food he got the gold that he had in his pocket to pay the tax collector. And out of this, you know, you alimented cities and civilization and all the rest of it. You, you make clear that in addition, Byzan uh, the, 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 the leaders of, of Byzantium sort of used the, knew how to use the penalty of power, uh, religion, the court. Uh, so all of these were elements uh, uh, including religion, for winning allies, uh, making other peoples uh, aware of the power that might or might not be used? Well, there were Christians. They did believe in salvation. They believed it was their religious duty to, to save as many people as possible. The Byzantine Empire was responsible for converting the Russians to Christianity. The Russians had been pagans. The Russians could have become Muslim, historically. The Muslims did reach into southern Russia. They're still there today. Instead, they became Christian because of Byzantium. They converted the Slavs in general, the Bulgarians, the Serbs, the Croats, and so on. They, um, but given that they had to do it for religious reasons, they also, the emperor was the secular head of the church and the prestige and authority of the empire, of the emperor and the empire benefited greatly from the fact that it was the center of Orthodox Christianity. Uh, the Russians at times attacked the Byzantines, but much of the time they were the allies and supporters of Byzantium once they were converted. And they operated their Christianity in a way to do it. Hagia Sophia, the great church built by Justinian, the miraculous church built in 540, not by mere architects, but by mathematicians with the huge golden dome that astonished ancient visitors and, and astonishes tourists today. When people would arrive, foreign envoys would arrive from their yurts, from their tents, their shacks, you know, the little huts or whatever they came or the rudimentary rock forts, they would arrive in Constantinople and be led up 
to the entrance of this church with these giant flying buttresses and would enter, come under the cupola and hear the singing, the wonderful singing of the, of the, uh, the, of the Byzantine liturgy, you know, which is the Gregorian chanting and uh, in the, uh, what in the West was Gregorian chanting was their wonderful, they invented, as you know, musical notation. Uh, it was, uh, church music was a Byzantine invention, one of many. The, there were the choruses and then there were the priests wearing their magnificent golden robes and attire. So the imagery, and then there was the burning of incense. So there was the smell, the music, the appearance. And then looking up to see this dome that seems to be floating, you know, because of the clever way the windows are. People, when there, they thought that they had died and gone to heaven, you know, <laughs> literally. And, and uh, they made an overwhelming impression. And now, you know that the emperor is the man who is in charge of this and so much more. And therefore, an attitude of deference to the emperor, to want to serve him, a desire to be at his court. So that led to all these potentates scattered around the place in the Caucasus, in every valley there was somebody claiming to be a prince. They, they were given titles at the Byzantine court. They were made, let's call them dukes and counts and margraves and, and they were terribly, because of that they were willing to serve the emperor. They were willing to send their men to fight for the emperor. Mm -hmm. uh, about the third of, the last third of the book uh, deals with uh, military manuals, essentially, yeah. that uh, describe uh, uh, and, and make us aware of the insights uh, of this Byzantine military strategy. I, one has the sense of you, the strategist, coming upon these things as a like a little kid in a cookie jar. But but tell us tell us a little about them. I mean, there's a we, we, we don't have a lot of time to discuss it. But but in 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 in, in brief, these manuals sort of prove your point about both the strategic culture and the insights that they had. Right. The field manuals were actually official documents written by experienced um, generals, admirals, if you like. There's a huge d discussion that some of them were not. They were written by mere scribblers. But we know that the most important were clearly written by practitioners. It's completely obvious that the, by people of real experience. Now, when I came across them, this was enormously exciting for me because at the time, I was uh, working as a consultant for the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command and working on the new edition of their base capstone manual, they call 100-5, which is the basic field manual of the U.S. Army and which gets renewed every X years. That was a major renewal. They hired me as a consultant. Here I am working on the field manual, mm. and at the same time, I'm reading uh, the Byzantine field manual. And first one, then others, then successfully over the years, scholars such as Father Dennis McGeer and others started, uh, they produced more of them, made them available, uh, Holden, was now Princeton, made available more of them, and then I found some that existed only as the original uncommented Greek text, but were printed, and eventually uh, one of them came out very obscurely, but finally I had a whole collection of them. And in them, as you say, there is the overall concept of statecraft, then there is the intelligence and how to gather intelligence, including some very good tricks that can still be used today. And then there is how you use intelligence. First of all, to outmaneuver the enemy, not to destroy him and destroy yourself in the process. Outmaneuver him. And then in detail, and then the detailed tactics and so on. And finally, there was the part that was the real parallel with the US Army's 100-5, which is, what the army would say, how to fight the force, in the actual battle tactics and so on. But unlike the Romans or the Americans, for the Byzantines, this fighting was always under the heading saying, minimize it. Do the minimum you must 
not the mostest with the fastest, but the leastest and the latest, because you have to survive hundreds of years and you can't burn yourself out. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I think uh, our listeners are going to have to read the book themselves, but I think we've, we've given them a sense of, of what you, the strategist, discovered and why you took so much time. But I want to bring this up to the present oh. and ask you, what uh, are, are we to take this book uh, as a work of history, but uh, as people interested in policy, what are they to draw from it? And I, I have a quote here uh, which would suggest that the relevance may be limited. And you write, in the court of Constantinople, the attraction of power was much greater because unlimited by laws, regulations, audits, parliamentary interventions, or judicial review, the emperor could castrate, blind, behead, and provide succor, promote to any position and demote an exile, give the most valuable gifts and confiscate, endow a man with a rich estate or take away all his possessions. So leadership uh, had, well, you, it, it seems to be unlimited in its power, but on the other hand was self-limiting based on what you've just said. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so does that say that this experience uh, uh, is not relevant to uh, the United States today as we think about how we deal with many adversaries with diminished resources. Well, of course, uh, one should, one cannot enslave history and, and you know summon history to help one, you know, with today's problems and so on, for many reasons, including the reason you just mentioned, the emperor was different. Now, he was not a Saddam Hussein, and he was not an Adolf Hitler. He was, in fact, bound. Uh, some emperors were pretty wild, but most of them, uh, most of the time, would have uh, laughed at the notion that they were free to do what they wanted. They were bound, in, first of all, by the Christian religion. That's the reason, by the way, even people who tried to kill the emperor were not executed. They were blinded, cruel, if you like, but taking life away was God's prerogative. They were bounded by the, the, most of them by the crushing sense of responsibility of having inherited the emperor. I'm the emperor now. It's my job to survive in this hostile world where 800 years was 800 years of war, 800 years of being attacked by somebody somewhere. So all of this. But nevertheless, certainly if the Byzantines were around today, they would look at some of the things we're doing and would say, you know, if if we'd been around, <laughs> we would have different ideas. I mean, you know, Afghanistan, the case in point. For us, Afghanistan is a terrible conundrum. It's a horrible place to stay in, and it is supposedly dangerous to leave, because that's where terrorism is. Well, that is a whole different discussion, because, you know, terrorism these days seems to be in Fort Hood and Chicago and so on, but never mind. The Byzantines would say, wait a minute, the Taliban are Pashtun. Okay. They are, belong to the Patan, the Pashtun speakers, Patan ethnicity. The other fellows are Uzbeks and Tajiks and Hazara. Why do we need to send G.I. Joe there? Why don't we arm the Uzbeks, Hazara, and Tajiks? Mm -hmm. And by the way, since the, Uzbe the Uzbekistan, the Republic of Uzbekistan, the Republic of Tajikistan themselves are greatly threatened by the Taliban. They're already embattled against Islamic insurgencies. And their great patron, Russia, is itself in battle in Chechnya and so on. Why don't we get the Russians to provide the weapons that we will hand over to the Azara, the Uzbek, and the Tajiks? Have them provide the weapons and have Uzbekistan provide the logistics instead of us shipping F-16s from the United States to Afghanistan. So by the time they get there, they cost three times what they cost us here. So the Byzantines would, given the long perspective, say, how do we do this cheaply? Cheaply means don't send troops, because in those days, like today, their troops were very expensive. The Byzantine soldier, trained for three years, very well equipped with his good weapons, his good uniform, his good stuff, was expensive. You can't afford it. You didn't have many of them. You can't afford it. Our soldiers apparently cost $1 million per head per 12 months. 
So at this rate, we should be thinking of sending 12 of them to Afghanistan, <laughs> you know, and then dealing with it by mobilizing the others and saying to people, wait a minute, we live 12,000 miles away. You, Uzbeks and Russians and Tajiks and so on, are right next door. You deal with the problem. And, you know, in regard to Pakistan, instead of shipping $5,000 million to the Pakistanis so that the Pakistani army and intelligence can continue playing with us, pretending to help, not helping, trying to help, helping a little, then stopping, then they would go to the Pakistanis and say, listen, India is behind you. You either do what we say, or we will induce, bribe, persuade the Indians uh, to put, squeeze you. And instead of holding the Indians, we would say to the Indians, take Kashmir, take the lot, deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, today, we're not in Byzantine times. There are nuclear weapons around. We have a global interest in preventing a nuclear war anywhere. We do. And so there are limitations, and you can't be unlimitedly clever you know, by copying tricks from history. But certainly, our very Roman attitude, yeah, that's uh, you know, comes into question. So, so, so the, 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 in your terms, the problem is how does Rome become more like Constantinople? Right. That, that's the American right. problem. That's the American problem. I hear people comparing Afghanistan to Vietnam. Now, Vietnam, there was nobody in Vietnam. There's the, there's the ocean on one side. There were weak states. And we couldn't force anybody to fight in Vietnam for us against the Viet Cong. Plenty of people didn't like North Vietnam, but we could not manipulate them into acting against North Vietnam. Afghanistan is different. Mm -hmm. Even Iran, which is our great enemy from many points of view in many different areas, the Iranians have 100 percent correlation with us in opposing the Taliban. The Taliban are Sunni extremists who view the 12 Shia Iranian regime as a regime of heretics, heretics deserving of death. Therefore, the Iranians, when the Taliban ruled Afghanistan, the Iranians were mobilized on the Afghan border. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. We can call on all of them. If you are a Roman, you ignore all of them. And you send a huge army to destroy and kill off all the Taliban. If you're Byzantine, you take advantage of this. Mm -hmm. so, so look, I, I hear, uh, after reading your book, which I did do, uh, I, I see two problems uh, that prevent us from moving from being Rome to being Constantinople. Uh, one is the, the poor quality of our intelligence. By that, I mean, do we understand all of these different peoples that you just described in, in, in this region in the way the Byzantians would have understood? Them? And then the other problem I see is that Rome, once you're Rome, you create institutions that blind you to how you should adapt. And so, therefore, you can't see that, hey, we can get these other people to do the things we need done. Could you address those? Am I right about those two things? Well, yes, this is the central problem. In regard to the latter, uh, our institutions involve an extremely successful, professionally successful, highly competent uh, armed forces. We have an excellent army, we have a superlative Marine Corps, we have wonderfully effective Air Force and Navy and so on. All of them are also proponents of their own solutions. So the Air Force believes in taking pictures, let's say. They don't have a cheap uh, UAV to take pictures. They would send an expensive F-15 that is $4,000 per flying hour and so on. Um, the, our, the Marines are great, but when you send the Marines somewhere, they want to fight the battle. Uh, they look even now in, in Afghanistan. They're looking for their Fallujah, their opportunity to take on the Taliban. Stand, let us take us on, have our battle. They are proponents, and as you as you saw right now, uh, President Obama, he has General McChrystal and General Petraeus. Uh, General Petraeus with the doctorate and so on. You know, the author of the Country Surgery Manual, which is this thick, um, and so. On. All of them proposing their solution. If he would have sent there a, uh, a Byzantine envoy, somebody like 
like uh, the, you know, one of the Byzantine ambassadors, like Zemarcus, who was sent with a small retinue of body servants and a ceremonial guard. And he was in Afghanistan. He wouldn't uh, recommend troops. He would figure out, he would say, uh, give me some money to bribe X and give me, uh, and put some pressure on the, like, go and talk to the Indians, let's do that, let's talk to, let go to Tashkent and ask the ruler of Uzbekistan, is, you know, Islam Khanimov, how he would like it if the Afghan win in Uzbekistan. So yes, that's, and then the other problem, the first problem, the great problem, intelligence. When you are a great nation like the American nation, and so much is going on within the United States, it's very hard to see beyond the borders. Very hard to see. Uh, when uh, you see, you know, it's very hard to comprehend the outside world when you are the same. If you live in Liechtenstein and Luxembourg and Monaco, or even, you know, in, in Prague and so on, you know that the outside world is half an hour away. And you think about Germany, you think about outside cultures, you hear foreign languages, you are brought, when you are in a great nation like the United States, it's very hard to comprehend, understand, and so on. There is a certain lack of feel. The Central Intelligence Agency, therefore, through the years, through the decades, while it sits next to our State Department with its excellent diplomats. And I don't mean great names. I mean the fellow you meet early in the early morning in some minor post. He's so much more competent and hardworking than his counterparts of other countries. We have very competent sergeants. We have very competent colonels. We have very competent, uh, you know, um, diplomats. And we do not have competent intelligence. We just don't. And we, we, every time something happens, they're behind the wall of secrecy, so they project competence and claim it. But every time something happens, we make startling discoveries. Like in the midst of the Iranian crisis back in 1979, only one person in the Central Intelligence Agency knew Farsi. Now, I myself have been. I have encountered CIA people who get paid for their knowledge of Italian, and they don't speak Italian. <laughs> okay, they have crude, a crude, primitive language they think is Italian. In other words, even at the level of linguistic knowledge. Now, compare that in Byzantine times when a delegation came from what is now China, Xinjiang, arrived in Constantinople and started talking. There was an interpreter at the court who could translate his language, which was the first Turk of the first Turk Khanat Empire from what is 3,000 nautical, I mean 5,000 kilometers away. Even elementary linguistic knowledge is lacking. Secondly, the CIA, whereas the military are able to generate endless numbers of competent soldiers and sergeants and fitters and repairmen, and the Air Force routinely flies its airplanes that are crushing into the ground, and the Navy handles all the ships, the CIA fails and fails and fails. So we do have a cultural problem there. Edward, uh, uh, I think that you've demonstrated in this hour uh, why everybody wants to go out and read your book, uh, even if they know nothing about uh, a Byzantium uh, civilization. So uh, here's the book again, and I want to thank you very much uh, for writing the book and for coming back and to our program and talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.